This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. They say space is the final frontier. If it's anything like prior frontiers, it's gonna need a sheriff to ride into orbit to keep the peace. As long as people are people, some of them will commit crimes, so wherever people go, crime will follow. As we head into Earth orbit, then out to the solar system and the galaxy beyond, it stands to reason we'll need police in space, so today we'll be looking at that and in the broader sense the future of police, some of the stranger crimes they might see, and even some scenarios like galactic police and time police. Of course we often figure a future humanity will be a more enlightened one, maybe one with few to no crimes, and we'll discuss that too, as well as some other scenarios where crime might cease to be, even if humanity didn't get particularly enlightened. We'll also be exploring some more science fiction notions of crime and policing that might not be science fiction for too much longer. Speaking of science fiction though, a lot of sci-fi is essentially the Wild West in space, frontiers, pioneering spirit, strange new friends and enemies with alien ways, and not much in the way of law and order, till the sheriff comes to town of course, and of course, often a new sheriff because they tended to have a fairly short tenure, far from the rule of law and backup. It's not too hard to imagine that on distant and sparsely colonized worlds, rough lands needing rough folks. Just as often in pioneer towns there was law and there was order, but it wasn't always too synonymous with justice. This or that company or exploitative nobleman or major landholder pretty much ran the show, and the law enforcement were thugs in their open employ or on the take or just didn't have much choice but to enforce the law as best they could on most things while bending to the powers that be, which were privileged. Uh, literally too, privilege derives from the Latin words privus and legis, or private and law respectively, laws applying in favor or against an individual rather than one law for all and none above or below it. It's pretty easy to imagine an asteroid mine having law enforcement that worked for whoever controlled that mine, and dispensed justice in accordance with that. Private security forces might be the norm for early space colonization. Now, this is a bit of a separate issue from when the first law enforcement officer off Earth will be appointed. We can mostly ignore the current treaties we have for space, they are interesting but are really only placeholders for dealing with space until we've actually got a major presence there, and some experience knowing what we should be negotiating for. They are hardly irrelevant, but getting stuck in the weeds of those treaties doesn't serve much point as they'll likely all be renegotiated, if not just tossed aside or ignored, long before we have a big footprint of many thousands of folks off Earth. During those early days of minor presence, we basically have two scenarios, remote scientific or industrial outposts that are far from Earth and probably made up of the cream of the crop, and folks in low orbit in routine construction or on space tourism. Those are two very, very different scenarios. Astronauts and scientists can certainly commit crimes, but generally are not going on motor sprees or stealing from each other on base. Indeed, the one alleged crime to have taken place in space thus far, a bit of a news item for late 2019, which we won't comment on besides saying that if true, involved the misuse of a spouse's bank password during divorce, which hardly excuses it but is also hardly the stuff crime dramas and westerns are made of. Something worse is bound to happen over a long enough time, but when you're dealing with folks you've carefully screened for their backgrounds and reliability, not only is crime less likely, but the other folks there with similar backgrounds are likely to be able to serve in a law enforcement role in a pinch too. Some Mars base is likely to be composed of a lot of folks with a military background and likely to have cameras and sensors all over the place, so nobody is expecting to commit a crime without getting caught, and everybody is going to be ready to dogpile anyone who does since it's likely to be because of some stress-based psychological snap, and now you're not talking justice, you're talking wrestling someone down to the ground before they accidentally, or purposely due to insanity, kill everyone by rupturing the hull, or dome or tent you're all in, or doing some other critical damage that leaves everyone to die, quick or slow. That's a big part of why we screen astronauts so thoroughly, stress can cause accidents and nervous breakdowns or fits of anger or despair. It's not until you either have very large bases raising your sample size so that rare incidents can become normal, or you have to lower your equipment standards to fill all the job vacancies, that you need to start considering a full-time and trained police officer. Until then, it would just be a hat worn by the commander or some other crew member, same as cook or medic or a bunch of other roles that you have to distribute to a limited crew. It's also only till you're outside of easy communication range that you need any real prisoner handling procedures and protocols and facilities. 
You just tie someone up while you call home to the experts for advice and you don't really care about things like Miranda rights or evidence handling because you don't actually care that much if the case gets tossed in court on a technicality or a civil lawsuit in comparison with a safe and successful continuation of the mission. And given the small number of suspects and constant monitoring, they're going to have plenty of evidence in most cases, even if some confession got tossed out for improper procedures. That's a very different case than what we get in space tourism, which is going to be a growing industry in decades to come. Early tourists will generally be fine with putting up with the general lack of privacy involved, plus going through all sorts of security checks by groundside private security or law enforcement officers before going up, and probably with medical and psychological screenings, but that won't last. Once the initial novelty wears off and the numbers involved grow to hundreds a day, with folks staying there for weeks at a time and wanting to do stuff besides float around in zero gravity, you start having the real, ordinary issue of crime in play. Someone is going to get their name in the annals of history for being the first person to smuggle contraband on board, someone is going to get in a drunk fight, someone is going to kill someone. At some point that is going to be big enough that you're going to need security forces on board and they are going to have to have jurisdiction and authority and everything else that comes with a badge. Now when we get to the first detective is a whole different story. In those early days and those places close to Earth where light lag is minimal, you can bring your investigators in by remote and essentially conscript those onboard security forces or any other crew to help as needed under supervision, even deputizing random passengers or guests if need be. On the flip side, any interstellar colony needs to have a functioning and complete police force from day one, because home and help are years of communication time away, and day one needs to be from the day they launch, not the arrival date when they land, because those journeys would take decades or far longer. But even once you get out to the asteroid belt, those communication times are long, too long for fair trials to be conducted by remote, when a response to a lawyer or judge might take an hour and reach the jury an hour later. Any detective from home is dealing with many hours of delay on every instruction, during which evidence might decay beyond usability or the criminal might be able to destroy it or interfere with the investigation with the detective far away and tenuously able to act. Now you might be able to develop a reasonably fair protocol for handling long delayed court cases with everyone offering written or recorded testimony conducted by correspondents, but that is likely to be a mess and likely to spark a lot of appeals and civil rights concerns. Hard to claim you got a fair trial if your lawyer never was closer than a billion kilometers to you and it took an hour to exchange every answer, and that might be fine for civil cases, misdemeanors, and maybe lesser felonies, but if we're talking murder, where the severity of the possible punishment usually grants the defendant the most vigorous defense, I doubt that would fly. Alternatively, we could fly the person home, but such journeys might involve prisoner transports of months or years. And even if we start getting very powerful engines capable of sustained 1G thrust for days at a time, you're still talking weeks. At a minimum you'd need to be able to deal with misdemeanors and lesser felonies locally, or have some way of shipping prisoners, and beyond the security problems and costs, I wouldn't want to be the person who ships someone home on a charge that didn't get convicted and required the accused to spend months in a brig, or alternatively maybe put into stasis or getting frozen. What's more, those are likely to be sparsely populated bases, or ships. Nowadays if some outpost or ship has a crime, they can rely on rapid communication to home and if necessary military or police assets arriving to handle the matter in hours, not months. But if you're some ice miners out in the Kuiper Belt, spending years out at a time attaching drive and steerage components to comets to send them in system, you could be looking at hours or even days of communication delay time and that is presumably a for-profit venture with a minimal crew. Now we do have a precedent for this. Ship's captains traditionally had to handle crimes as even when they were near some port, it often wasn't their home country anyway, and they might be away from any port, friendly or otherwise, for many months. Maritime law, or admiralty law, has long been a popular reference in science fiction for captains handling crimes on ships, and it might see a resurgence in the future. Now, contrary to popular belief, it is not legal anymore for ship's captains to conduct trials and hang folks, but it was a power held in ancient days and not so ancient days. Indeed historically maritime law was fairly uniform until more recent times, when the rise of our more modern notion of nations saw lots of individual laws by country and flag, which only became uniform again near the beginning of the 20th century. We might see a divergence happen again as we venture out to space, especially interstellar space, 
But while it makes for good drama, I doubt we'd see a lot of ships having motor trials conducted on board by the captain and ending with someone getting shoved out in an airlock. Great big colony ships with great big crews can have great big judicial systems too. In other cases, often the technology will permit alternatives like throwing someone on ice or in stasis till they can be dealt with, or even getting to some of the more peculiar options like reprogramming someone's mind or virtual prisons. The future is about more than just fast spaceships after all, there's a pretty big electronic component to our future and more than just in how we move data around. Though speaking of that, as I mentioned earlier, the only alleged crime to have occurred in space thus far involved a cybercrime, but doubtless we've already had a ton of crimes take place that bounced around one satellite or another. Now fortunately, modern communication satellites are effectively mirrors or relays for data, not hosts or actors, so thus far we haven't really had to worry about the space aspect of any given crime. Whatever data was transmitted left some place and arrived some other place and can be accessed from those for investigation and jurisdiction concerns. We won't be focusing on cybercrime today because that's its own topic and one we looked at more in cybersecurity last fall, but we do need to consider ideas like virtual crime, not to mention all the avenues for new crimes, and new evasion of justice that things like mind augmentation introduce into the equation. We also need to consider the role artificial intelligence is going to play in helping us solve crimes and the often overlooked issue, in science fiction, of how you would prosecute and punish an AI. Folks tend to just end stories involving crimes perpetrated by an AI with it being switched off, killed if you would, though that's a bit problematic since you can't commit a crime unless you're a person, and if you can commit a crime you presumably are entitled to be tried by a jury of your peers and due process. Of course we might do away with that in favor of having AI be your judge and jury, and computers as objective judges is another popular sci-fi trope. Whether or not an AI could serve as an objective judge, or at least more objective than the other human, is rather debatable. Being a computer does not magically grant it objectivity and rationality, that's one of those weird notions of early sci-fi that popped up and stuck along with notions that machines couldn't lie for some reason, but it does raise the whole notion of what we're actually judging. We investigate crimes because we don't know who done it, and we have trials because we are trying to confirm who done it to a certain degree of certainty, but that gets rather redundant if the vast majority of crimes are caught on camera and we can scan people's brains to see if they are lying. Now we cannot do so at this time. Contrary to popular belief, polygraph lie detectors are not admissible as evidence for some random arbitrary reason. They are not admissible because they aren't ultra-reliable. Whether they're mostly reliable or about as accurate as phonology, measuring someone's brain pan, is quite a topic of heated debate and not of interest to us today. The point is that they aren't reliable enough to be citing guilt and innocence. That should not be assumed to remain the case with future versions using different approaches. We might get brain scans so good they couldn't be fooled or be wrong, but the standards they would need to meet to be used as evidence would rightfully be quite high. Of course we might get ways to alter memories or brains to fool such things. If you can read memory then you can write memory and erase memory, and memory is not like a digital recording or nicely indexed file, it is a big massive dumpster heap and part of why we don't trust witnesses. It's not just concerns of dishonesty, it's outright certain that a witness's memory is not particularly reliable. Let's say I commit a crime then have my brain altered to remember sitting at home that afternoon. No lie detector brain scan is going to find me a liar because I'm not, my memory is changed. Now we might be able to prove the crime by other means, same as now since we obviously don't just take the defendant's word for it that they didn't do it, but it does raise the issue of whether or not that person with a changed memory is still guilty of that crime. There are some interesting legal precedents on the matter dealing with amnesiacs, and we discussed those more way back in our episode Consciousness and Identity where we also discussed the idea someone might implant a memory of committing a crime into someone else while erasing their own. That might be more than an afternoon's worth of events too. We could say that if someone killed someone then moved their mind to someone else's body that they are still guilty in that new body, but that gets a bit trickier if they are merging their mind with someone else's in a very major way, exchanging whole years of memory and effectively creating a new person. Similar notion, but if we ever see hive minds emerge via network human consciousness, Would a criminal who joined a hive mind now be innocent of previous crimes, or alternatively would that entire hive mind be guilty? The answer might depend a lot on how interconnected they all were. Similarly, if someone is forced to join a hive mind and when yanked free of it wants nothing more than to return to it, can we charge that hive mind with a crime when they refuse to press charges? 
and do we let that person go back? What about if a hive mind had a member who committed a crime? Would they all be equally guilty? How interconnected would they have to be for that to be the case? Also, we give lawyers and clergy and medical professionals certain privileges on communication and confidentiality with their clients, and we extend something similar to spouses, and it wouldn't be hard to imagine various hive or networked minds being able to claim a similar privilege to its members, as an interesting bit of food for thought. Similar things might tend to apply to AI too, not so much in terms of them having distributed or node intelligence akin to a hive mind, but in terms of AI who serve a person being able to refuse to participate in offering records or testimony. The notion of AI acting as judges or police or criminals themselves in virtual landscapes raises some other landscapes we might have to deal with, the galaxy at large or even space-time itself. Now, galactic police might have to face some very hard times dealing with the lag time of light speed communication, they might have crimes that took place over worlds separated by light years, or need to spend decades tracking down a criminal who is fleeing to interstellar space. The job of Bounty Hunter, always a popular one in science fiction, might fit that sci-fi mode very well, as they tend to be rugged loners and if you need to spend decades traveling in stasis to catch up to your target, that tendency to being a loner is likely to help and likely to happen as you get totally unglued from your home civilization that you might not see for centuries at a time. Similar things might happen with Space Pirates, a topic we looked at some months back as they might tend to form their own very distinct subculture simply from their separation in time and space from needing to hide out and hijack slow-moving interstellar ships. There's also the notion of policing entire species. Should the galaxy end up as one of those places full of alien civilizations, be they naturally evolved from mini homeworlds or just divergent products of a galactic humanity, you might end up with some overall authority that enforce certain universal laws or trade agreements or similar. That might end up as something like the implied rule of the mysterious Ancient Aliens in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey series, where the aliens tend to help out emerging sapient races and protect them from each other, and in a harsher interpretation, wipe out the troublemakers. Considering the light lag issues and the sheer time involved, it wouldn't be hard to imagine some advanced AI serving this role, or effective race of AI galactic police. That's out the window if we ever find a method of fast and light travel, as it would then be possible to communicate law changes and negotiate and investigate over light years and less than years, but as we often point out on the show, fast and light travel is typically synonymous with time travel, most hypothetical methods that do one do the other too. Of course that raises another popular plot in sci-fi which is Time Cops. If folks can flee to different times, we need to be able to follow them and find some way to prevent them changing the past if that's possible. It's hard for such an agency not to be vulnerable to being wiped out by anyone who can travel back in time to prevent them ever forming, but it depends a lot on what sort of time travel option is in play, and we discuss those more in our time travel episode. You can get some real issues with crime there too, like folks robbing someone by stealing their idea or winning lottery number or patent and jumping back in time to claim it as their own, or getting revenge on someone who hurt them by killing them as a kid or keeping their grandparents from marrying. If you ever had time crimes you'd end up needing something like an A-causal investigation department just for all the crimes that had their sequence of events and motives happen out of order. You might also see folks arrested before they committed crimes, something contemplated in Philip K. Dick's famous short story, Minority Report. In such cases, whether by time travel or advanced prediction precognition, crime might cease to exist. So too, a deeper understanding of the human mind might see crime massively curtailed or eliminated. That raises the issue of how you figure out if someone can be charged with a crime if they haven't committed it yet. We do have a basic principle for that, attempted murder and so on, but how early can you stop something like that and still reasonably say the person was going to commit the crime? Under current legal thought, you need to have evidence they are going to do it, but that's pretty tricky if you are interrupting a crime of passion before the event that inspired it, and it also depends a lot on the nature of time. If you got branching future realities, there is presumably one universe where they did it and one where they did not. We won't even get into law enforcement in a multiverse case, though it offers some amusing options like snatching your multiverse clone to frame for a crime or use to fake your own death, or just finding that universe where you were a famous billionaire and doing away with that person and taking their place. One thing is for sure though, the future in space and beyond will have no shortage of options for crime, so there's not likely to be a shortage of police either. 
We were talking a lot today about artificial intelligence, and it's a fairly regular topic on the show because it will be such a key part of the future in almost every aspect of human endeavor. If you're curious about AI, neural networks, and other computer concepts, there's a number of amazing courses on this topic at Brilliant. Neural nets are one of the expanding fields of computer science, and Brilliant has an excellent course on the topic. Brilliant's focus on fun and interactive methods makes them a great choice whether you're a student, a parent trying to enhance your kid's education, a professional brushing up on cutting edge topics, or someone who just wants to use this time to understand the world better, you should check out Brilliant. Try adding some learning structure to your day by setting a goal to improve yourself, and then work at that goal just a little bit every day. Brilliant makes that possible with interactive explorations and a mobile app that you can take with you wherever you are. If you are naturally curious, want to build your problem solving skills, or need to develop confidence in your analytical abilities, then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new. Brilliant's thought provoking math, science, and computer science content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and breaking them up into bite sized, understandable chunks. You'll start by having fun with their interactive explorations, over time, you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. If you'd like to learn more science, math, and computer science and want to do it at your own pace and from the comfort of your own home, go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and try it out for free. So next week we'll explore graphene, the super strong material that might have an enormous impact on our civilization and permit the creation of some truly enormous space habitats. Then in two weeks we'll look at those enormous megastructures you can make with graphene and by some other methods in continent-sized rotating space habitats as we head into July. Before that we'll close out the month of June with our monthly livestream Q&A at 4pm Eastern Time, Sunday, June 28th. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes, you can donate to us on Patreon or on our website, IsaacArthur.net, which will link to the episode description below along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts of the episode and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.